or as they prefer occasionally to be called, very enthusiastic friends. So my mom used to refer to it as the please fuck with me face. If there's anyone with remote closeness to me that has deeply crippling emotional issues, they will be glued to my ass like there is no tomorrow. And I was wondering with this experiment if there was a way to test that as well, to see if I could provide distance without being cruel. And I figured out a way. Now some of the people, if it's just not in public, it'll be through my phone. I'll get tons of picture messages every day, constant texting, like, oh my god, look, I have a dog, here's my dog wearing a hat, here's my dog from a different angle, did you know that I have a dog? Or, hey, look, I made this food, I'm gonna eat this food, it looks great, right? Constant bombardment of the mundane day-to-day -day tasks. And usually when those happen, I'll just ignore them. No, I don't care to have a picture of you making a duck face saved in my files forever. No, I don't really care that there's another picture of you at a slightly different angle. So I just ignored it. And shortly after that, the friends that I cared about keeping realized that this pattern wasn't really drawing me the best way, so they toned it down. The people that I didn't really feel like keeping anyway became offended and quickly left. Another area of interest was to see how this experiment would affect my romantic life, which, as you can probably imagine by looking at me, not the greatest track record anyway. Let me clarify. I vibe on the crazy. Hardcore. Love it. Like, one of the necessary attributes on my checklist is that you pretty much have to be batshit insane. The model used to be, well, I get really bored of people, so I probably have the attention span of a four-year-old. You have the emotional maturity to match, and you're probably an alcoholic. We can't go wrong! And those relationships are fun while they last. They're interesting. They're dynamic. But, dear God, when it ends, <laughs> It's like World War III has just started. The fallout is explosive. And I'm not surprised, but like most people, I like to complain when things don't go my way. Some people get that. They're willing to just sit and listen to me vent. Then there are those with the superiority complex that choose these moments to not only belittle my logic and choices, but to compare themselves to the ex in question in hopes of planting that little seed that I might someday prefer them. Everybody has a friend like this, like a mosquito just constantly in your ear trying to take control of every scenario and every potential in front of you. The, well, I could have told you that that guy was no good for you, but you needed to learn by yourself kind of person. Oh, really? You could have told me that this emotionally infantile, alcoholic psychopath was not long-term marriage material? Well, clearly, you are just an all-knowing sage of wisdom, and it's opened my eyes to the point now where I see that you're the perfect match for me. So should I drop my pants for you now, or would you prefer later? <clears throat> but then, when that doesn't work out quite the way that they're thinking, there's a pattern that is always carried and followed. First, there's the pining, the, well, nobody wants me, it's okay that you don't want to be with me, I know that I'm so unattractive, I'm so boring, I will compliment you while blatantly hinting that I want to sleep with you, and I expect you to at some point, but I'm too nice to come flat out and say it. And after that comes the rationalizing, well the, of course you don't want to be with me, you're hung up on the psychopath still. And ultimately, rejection on my part and resentment on theirs. Always the same exact pattern, and I get sick of it because I don't feel like it's justified. I'm typically a passive person. If you are annoying the ever-living hell out of me, I'll just ignore you until you leave, or I'll slowly distance myself until the hint is gathered that I don't want that attention. One of the most obvious things about me is that I have no problem voicing attraction. You know, I can't always guarantee you eloquence. It might not be some soliloquy over a balcony. It could be something just as simple as, hey, so I've been thinking, and I'd really like to touch my bits with your bits. You think we could work that out sometime? But I can promise you, it will at least be voiced. Through the course of the experiment, I wanted to see if it was just those select few people that were that bad at the flirting and mating ritual, or if it was just people in general. So I decided I was gonna sign up for a dating site. I got the basic package, no personal information, just a picture of me with the hot girl disguise and a personality quiz. My first day of creating it, I had 21 messages, running the full gamut from the you know, from your profile, I can tell that you're very introspective and dynamic, and I would love to share a $10 cup of coffee with you while you discuss global economics. To the dull, poorly worded, often hilarious come-ons that essentially come down to, so, uh, I've got a penis. You feel like maybe we can get together sometime? 
and I've gotten this idea that I feel like I need to share with everyone advice-wise. If someone is flirting with you that is either so uncreative or so lazy that they cannot string together a basic sentence, what makes you think that there would be anything but uncreative and lazy in bed? These applications are quickly passed over. Now another note, if I happen to be single, it's not because I'm unhappy or haven't found the right person or that you should bombard me with this awkward solicitation. It means that I'm more than content with my current status. A relationship in the future would be nice, but for now, I'm content enough to sit in my pajamas with a box of bronzia and terrible horror movies. That's just a level of freedom that I'm not really to give up yet without judgment. Now another facet of my life that was interesting throughout this experiment is that based on my nationality, I am a champion drinker. I have a very large tolerance, I can conduct myself pretty well, but sometimes that is used to the advantage of other people. For example, at a birthday party a week ago, we received a noise complaint. Somebody decided that it should be my responsibility to go talk to the cop. So, you know, I'm dressed to the nines, kind of swaying to look like I'm not stumbling, and I migrate my drunk ass over to the car, lean in, and start talking to him. The very second that I feel the words, hey, cool story, bro, slur out of my mouth. Terror like you wouldn't imagine just went coursing through me. But apparently, my drunken rambling was so effectively annoying, not even did the cop leave, but we didn't receive another complaint or another drive-by the rest of that entire night. So sometimes it works out. Now, the final story involved with the drinking is the aftermath and kind of the unwanted effects of it. So I was at a friend's house and back in January, freezing, like heat of winter, snow everywhere, probably maybe 20 degrees in the living room. So we decided we needed to get a fire going. And we're in the fireplace trying to get the lighters to connect with the logs and nothing's happening. Yeah. Now I should make a note at this point that the friend in question does Civil War reenactments and has a steady supply of gunpowder at all times. So while we were on a quest to go find matches to conduct the fire, someone decided to help us out and pour half a pint of gunpowder into the fireplace. So we come back from the matches quest, really excited, get ready, crawl back in the fireplace, strike it, and connect it with the logs. And then a flash, and I was deaf and running and on fire. So we're running around the room, and we collide, look at each other, stomp the flames out, and just sit and laugh like hyenas, because explosions are exactly the way that they're portrayed in like the Bugs Bunny cartoons. You're covered in soot, your hair's straight back, you got the ringing in your ears, and you just have the oh shit, what happened face, because you can't recall 30 seconds earlier. So after that experience, coming through it with, you know, only mild burns, some hair missing, everything, thankfully, was able to be fixed, had us think about just how resilient people are in general. If you can come through a situation as ridiculous as that and come out that unscathed, I think that's a pretty miraculous situation to have happen, and the fact that it can be funny now is even better. So although that is the most epic of my injury stories, it's unfortunately not the most recent. And I can't even use the excuse of alcohol for this one because I happened to be stone cold sober that day. So you know, occasionally we all go through these phases where we're feeling kind of fancy, want to check ourselves out. So I was in the shower and I wanted to see what my butt would look like in the mirror, as you know, we all do from time to time. So I climbed up on the ledge of the tub, grabbed the shower curtain and the organizer for leverage, bent myself back to try to get a glimpse, and then I heard this ripping and prying noise. And all of a sudden, I am down on the tile with both things splayed on top of me. Were those bruises for two full weeks. <laughs> and that was not my proudest moment, but you know, it's something that taught me a little bit, mainly that floor length mirrors are a good accessory and a good investment if you'd like to check yourself out. <sighs> so being that extremely injury prone has made me also resilient and hardly anything can faze me anymore. So I suppose I should tell you all the aftermath of this experiment that I've conducted. Several different areas, disjointed and unrelated as they are, all came together. And after just a week of viewing the world through a different lens, I was no longer bound by petty obligation or coercion. I let go of everything unwanted, inconsequential, and stressful. The people in my life now are there because they choose to be, not for ulterior motives or because there's something they can gather. I've surrounded myself with precious people, precious circumstances, and even though occasionally the terrible things happen, come out better for it. So when you're feeling alone and stressed and on the verge of a breakdown, 
Just remember that the biggest comedy in life is that we take everything so seriously. Every situation, every moment can be used to improve yourself. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next up, we have Allison Ficklin. <laughs> So hang on. <laughs> okay. So I have three pieces. First of all, um, I have some stuff in the show too. This show is awesome, is it not? Um, before, uh, two nights before the deadline for all of the art pieces, that night I was at home going, I have to call Anne right now because there is no conceivable way I can get even a single piece done in time for the deadline. So I'm totally fucked, I'm sorry, I fucked you, that's it. Um, and as it turned out, then over the next six hours, I completed three pieces. Um, and that's just kind of how it works for me. So I've been saying for weeks and weeks in all these shows that, that you know, I'm gonna do some original stuff, I'm gonna do stuff you guys haven't heard, and then I just keep kind of redoing my old stuff. And um, tonight I have three pieces that are all brand new and are all original because um, I'm crazy and I wrote them all at once. Um, but before I do that, I noticed that, you know, the Spoken Word Samurai have a fan page on Facebook. Um, and a lot of our people are so amazing. And um, there's a guy who's on our fan page. Uh, his name's Rick Long. And actually, before I became a nurse, he taught me to tattoo. <laughs> um, and he actually wrote us a poem about the samurai. And I thought, it really needs to be recorded somewhere, because that's just awesome. So I just wanted to read that quick. I cut through phrases like a warrior poet. My tongue is my blade, dicing and slicing through context. I whip your imagination into a spiraling fray of joy and excitement. I am the spoken word of the samurai. Rick Long, AKA Tattoo Rick. <laughs> All right. So this first piece is called Indestructible. Um, I like to open every piece by saying, this is a true story. <laughs> my son warbles through his first unsteady steps. My hands extend behind him like an offering bowl, trying desperately to protect him with each backward toddle to the floor. My husband says, relax. It's not your job to catch him every time. If not me, then whose job is it? Our friend Kurt, at age 30, lost the three middle fingers of his right hand to a piece of farm machinery. He waited 45 minutes for the ambulance to arrive with his digits crushed between two metal plates that were devouring his dexterity. Finally, unable to wait any longer, he pulled at the knuckles. Skin stretching, muscle tearing, bone separating, because he could not wait one more second to cradle his chewed hand to his chest. Kurt also lost his left eye to a car crash, has had a total knee reconstruction, a hip displaced out of his pelvis due to a birthing calf, and still has glass lodged in multiple sites beneath his skin. It's said he broke his femur once, <laughs> snapped it straight across the thigh, but he won't tell anyone the story, not even his wife. He jokes about it all, saying, I might still be immortal, but no one ever said I was indestructible. <laughs> he is sweet as honey at the bottom of your tea, funny as a hunting dog chasing ladybugs, and charming as a bed and breakfast at the end of a long drive down a county road. He strolls through his one-eyed, seven-fingered life without complaint. <laughs> Ever since my son was born, I see Kurt differently. I look at him and I think, but this isn't what you looked like when you were born. I see him learning to count on his right hand. One, two, three. I see him crawling on an original knee, forming his first words out of an unscarred face and giving wet toddler kisses to the farm cats running between his legs. When his mother sees him, does she wonder why she couldn't get there in time to catch? Thanks for letting me make you into a metaphor. 
<laughs> this one is called Golden Ears. And I'm going to apologize for my husband. Um, it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, in a way, my friend um, Michelle, who's a physical therapist who's awesome, who might be watching, kind of helped me write this um, on her back patio one afternoon. So here it is. Why do so many people retire to Florida? I have no interest in knobbly knees, women's golf, and lawn maintenance. When I retire, I'm taking my friend Mary and moving to New Jersey. In my older years, I want to be where I can cultivate an accent, grow my hair big, talk loud, and never be wrong. <laughs> At age 65, I plan to take up smoking again. I will use it as punctuation. I will refuse to smoke Marlboro's or any other halfway decent brand. I plan to base my smoking choice on how irritating it is to have the smoke blown in your face. Ooh, I will smoke Doral 120s. <laughs> Not only do they taste terrible, but they smell even worse. I will blow it at you constantly. <laughs> Because secondhand smoke kills, but not reliably. I will drive a 1986 Monte Carlo SS with baby blue leather interior, a chrome chain for a steering wheel, and a snow white paint job with a detail of little blue blurred, little blue birds flying across the trunk. We will always talk about taking down the T-tops on sunny days, but never will, knowing the wind will just fuck up our hair. We will spend Saturday afternoons in the corner beauty parlor getting our nails sculptured and our eyebrows drawn back in. On alternate weekends, I will get all the hair pulled from my chin. I will insist the beautician call it tweezing, not plucking. What do I look like here, a fucking chicken? Mary and I will gossip about all our friends the very second anyone leaves the parlor. <laughs> we will say things like, did you see the attitude I got from her? I mean, don't get me wrong. I love her like a sister, but that skirt? <laughs> Dallas to Donuts says she's really a man. <laughs> we will then return to our four hour primping session. We will refuse all modern technology and convenience. I will find it much simpler in our older years to simply park on the street below your open apartment window and yell up, hey, you're coming or what? She will yell back down to me in return, saving us the expense of cell phone charges. <laughs> you look fine! We're just going, we're going to the White House? No, but you shouldn't have That's stupid! Just come out to the car. Oh, come on! You're really scheming me off! You got more clothes than I got hair on my head! Oh, forget it yourself! Why don't you just go see where you gotta go? I'm leaving! Our husbands have refused to go to the Garden State with us. We don't know why. <laughs> And I love you, Mary. <laughs> uh, okay, this is my last piece of the evening. I was complaining to Dave about a month ago that I kind of always wanted to be that person who could get up and be like, so I wrote this poem 30 minutes ago in my car, or this is the very first time I've read this out loud, and I am not that person. I said I could, I could write an entire poem on the obsessive notation system I have to deal with pauses. And he said, yeah, I think you should. <laughs> so as exciting as that sounds, I did it. Um, it's, it's called Write What You Know. Up here on the stage, I assuage my rage, and the speech I screech sounds smooth, rhythm and, rhythmic and right. Light on the teeth, my words are sheathed in a holster strapped to my boot. I hear your heart race when I pull it out, straining for truth when I cock, aim, and shoot. It's difficult to articulate my instrument so intimate from the bottom of a kiss to the back of a room. My tongue is strung to all four walls. The flow of my ligaments slick as a stimulant may seem sleek and seamless, but I have an obsessive streak. 
I have to get every bone, every tone, every grimy piece of gritzel exactly right into the bright light of day. I recount my recitation in my head, in my mouth, in my room, in my house, bellowing syllables about, bouncing them off the backyard fence again and again and again. I never feel zen. I stress and sharpen each gasp, each pause, each breath, and each is different. Preparing to perform, I perfect my form with a notation system I devised. I call it shorthand for the compulsively insane. I gain a measure of control, get closer to my goal. Every pace, meter, foot, and line, I'll grip tight in my white-knuckled fist. I will own my poem. See, for the length of time it takes for a loose eyelash to fall to the ground, for the space in between the dandelion seeds and its cotton lollipop bloom, for the break at the bottom of my breath, all are counted because poetry is a music with a rhythm only Beethoven can hear. What is the frequency of madness? I translate the vibration of my bones into lines, rhymes, and time. One comma for a gasp of air, an intake of breath, the places where oxygen runs out. One period for a purely perfect pause, the silence of our makers keeping pace. One beat. Two periods for two when I need a moment to think, but not enough to drink. For that, I need three, and it's usually one on every line to give us enough time to proceed through the process of expression. That doesn't even touch on tone, all caps for high, italics for low, and green for any whispered time. On top of all this, or rather beneath, there's gestures wrapped within my words, squeezed into the subscripts, banished to the basements of footnotes and afterthoughts. Not good enough to be spoken, but an equivalent participant if I want communication to continue. Will the crowd understand my point? pointing like a pistol shot at my parietal bone, shooting for the stars in the reach of my arms, driving my thoughts home with a crash, hitting head on. My obsession is perfection and it seeps between my pores. I drink from it from my veins like wine. The only problem present with reaching for perfection is when it's not exactly perfect, every letter, every scrawl, then it isn't worth doing or trying at all. My effort dies, reclined on the living room couch. Because quitting can camouflage itself as cool indifference. See? I never cared much anyway. I'm trying to let go without giving up. I quit half my life before I started. I gotta cut the ropes that bind me to the rules I've written. I've gotta ease the pressure. See, I'm not perfect, but I'm here and I'm me. So breathe. Four periods, last word in italics. <laughs> Samurai tonight. Donate money to our awesome charity. And um, who do I give the mic to? Hello, Mike. <laughs> All right, here's Dave Nesbitt. Oh, I barely knew what I was talking about the first time I walked. Wait, I barely know what I'm talking about at any given time when I'm coming up here. Michael, are you here yet? Let's all let's all just kind of look right about here and go out and get a beer. Take my advice. Come back. Michael is well worth checking out. Yeah.